know who could fight through something yeah. were the ones who were quitting the soonest because they couldn't surrender because they've got that fight mindset yeah. and couldn't give up to the pain. It's a strange and, and, I like, it? and I was like, oh god, yeah. yeah, the ones I would have thought could do it the, the best, yeah. it actually held them back. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But that's I, um, I, I was like, tried to do it, and then she just said, just focus on your breathing if it hurts, and I was like. Still hurts, but at least I'm breathing. Yeah. And, it, and but it's supposed to hurt, and you're supposed to go. It's okay that it hurts, and let go rather than fight through. Because if you fight through, you get tense, and it gets worse. Yeah. And oh, that was so. Yeah, I was like, oh yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, so watch, cool. watching the guys who were quitting. Yeah. Yeah, especially the tough guys. Are we good. We're already rolling. All right, <laughs> let's do it. Yeah. Today we'll worm the TV with. I'm gonna embarrass him. I did. I did give him. <laughs> head, I gave him a heads up on this. I actually told him on the phone yesterday how I was gonna do it, and then. I stopped myself, but I'm with who I believe is the UK version of John Danaher, which he's, you know, you're not, are you comfortable I, I, with or I, I, I will, you like it? I will take it as a massive compliment, but considering I look up to John Danaher anyway, that's, it's a compliment, but I, it's a bit too much. <laughs> no, no, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. If you don't know who John Danaher is, he's the guy that I'm going to be talking to in New York. Uh, so the, the grappling meister, the the, the 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 technician, you you got, got to give me that right. You you're quite good at tactics. I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah, it's I've had a bit of success with the yeah, coaching just, fighters and yeah, just a little bit of success. So we're going to start at the beginning with martial arts. Where did you start? Um, the Karate Kid and Mr Miyagi. Uh, Same here. Uh, I saw that and I saw well, I saw in the eighties movies kind of genres. I love the martial arts movies. And I actually had a thing for the dance movies as well, Breakdance, um, Mikhail Brishnikov in um, uh, White Knights. Yeah, with uh, Gregory Hines. Gregory Hines. Yeah. And I was like, okay, do I want to do dancing or do I want to do martial arts? And I didn't know anyone who did dancing, dancing. but my cousin did martial arts. So I went to a karate club and then stayed there for about I was up with that gymnastics with Jim Cutter. Yeah, that <laughs> Jim Cutter. Yeah, that yeah, is man. a terrible, terrible film. I'll tell you what, I'm convinced they're the Taliban. Because they're, because they're dressed like it, aren't they? Yeah, I got to admit, yeah, yeah, I go back and watch some of the, the martial arts movies of the 80s and I, I don't see now how they were so inspiring then because they were just, a lot of them were so awful. Dire. Yeah, they don't, they don't stand up well. Well, I, I used to have the No Retreat No Surrender poster on my wall and I tried to go back and watch it and um, there was entire characters. I was like, how? I don't even remember that character. Is it the minute, the minute the ghost of Bruce Lee turned up, I was, <laughs> I was fucking out of there. I was like, but Van Damme I could handle being Russian. Yeah, that... It, it, it is good when you look back at it and you just go, the Americans were that silly that it was like, if you're European, you can be basically anyone. Yeah. They, they, they're convinced that any actor's like Sean Connery. You know, Sean Connery, you're a Russian, okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah he won an Oscar for being <laughs> Irish with a, with a Scottish <laughs> accent, you know. That's, that, that, that's the highest level of art right there, you know. <laughs> so it was, it was the Karate Kid movies? Yeah, it was the Karate Kid, started being karate. Um, I did that for about eight years. Um, did like my first time with Anoida. And then, really? Yeah, did my, I didn't know that. Yeah, did my second down with Steve Cattle. Um, Jesus, so man, it, I didn't it, know this. Oh, it's strange because I look back now and a lot of the guys have all passed away now. All the guys I yeah. trained with. Um, and then... Steve Cattle was a tough old boy, wasn't he? He was, very, very. And it, it didn't look like a martial artist at all. <laughs> no, he was the all. first guy you'd mug. Yeah. Like, literally, <laughs> if someone said, you need money right now, short guy, myopic, bald, comb over, <laughs> the whole nine yards. Yeah, really? yeah, um, and then took a bit of a break for a while. During my teenage years, my health wasn't great. Had a lot of issues with my back and my leg, and just kind of stopped training. And then I happened to bump into Jeff Thompson, and yeah. it was strange. I, I met Jeff at a book signing, and he—I was using a walking stick at the time. I really wasn't moving very well, and he gave me one of his books, and I read it. It was *Fear*, a uh, friend of exceptional people, and it really spoke to me. And I, so I wrote him a letter and my phone number was on it and he phoned me up and he yeah. went and he said when I go to these events I'm looking to meet one person you were the person I wanted to meet yeah um I didn't want to make it easy for you but now you've done what you were supposed to do uh which is contact me so now I'm contacting you you need to come and see me right he invited me over to go and see him and then my dad used to take a, a morning off work and drive me over there really yes and then I did that every Thursday. Give your dad a shout out, by the way. I still say it's your brother, <laughs> which he likes, right? He will yeah. like that a lot. He does like that. He does like that. Because this is the thing. I remember we talked. We have talked about it in the past. 
But when you were saying your health wasn't bad, was that you know, psychosomatic or what was the situation there? Um, I've got an issue where my, my pelvis, I had a little instability in my pelvis and that meant that my lower back turned and that means I lost the, the curve in my lower back. Um, so I haven't got a curve there and one of the vertebrae won't pull in line either. So that means like all the discs are compressed and they deteriorated and that there's a nerve trap so I get pain down my leg from that and it's put a lot of weight on one side, so I've got arthritis in the hip now, and it was all just kind of, everything was kind of out of line, and as I grew, it just got worse. Yeah. Um, so I've always kind of suffered with that. Um, obviously people have much worse problems, it's just, it, it Yeah, makes, but you're not other people, that's not, I mean, yeah, people yeah. don't say that to me, get, yeah. a lot of people, and you go, yeah, but you're the one who has to live with it. Yeah, it just, it just means my, my mobility is not great, and um, there's just the chronic pain issue, but you know, you kind of work around that. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't get to train like I would want to, um, but, I don't have to have a proper job, so that's awesome. Well, that, yeah, that, I have to admit, that, I remember the first time, but I think it was, I picked you up. I, what, 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 I picked you up at the station, what was for that for? For the John Will seminar, was it, that? It was for the yeah. John Will seminar, we were talking and you were like, yeah, I've never had a real job. And I was like, what? Yeah. And, that, and that was like, Well, when awesome. I when I actually first uh, met Jeff, I was, it was around the time of MMA, then no holds barred just coming out yeah and i was because i've been stuck at home a lot and in pain a lot i'd been on like the very early internet stuff and i got in touch with this guy on one of the forums in america and we became friends and he started a website called sf uk yeah i remember sf uk so yeah. I, I was one of the moderators yeah um and i did a lot of the interviews i used to do the photo the event photos so because i was involved in that i was involved in all the very very early mma scenes so i used yeah. to get to lee Hazel's early events and all the different shows yeah. um but it was weird because i had that aspect which had, had come from being online and then i met jeff and obviously he had matty and and, yeah. all, and all the guys down there and justin and all the early mma fighters from there so i actually saw like the early cross training that was leading into mma in the uk yeah. and actually all the so the real world and the virtual yeah. world and then all the promoters I was meeting all the promoters like Lee Hasdell and uh, Paul Lloyd Davis and yeah. uh, Andy Jardine all the guys who are actually running shows and I was getting invited to all the shows so I was seeing all the early fighters who were yeah. actually putting it together yeah because I remember the first time we actually met was one of one of uh, Jeff's master classes yeah and me and Al were, me and Al were teaching and then we, me and you were talking and I remember you, you, you were a blue belt at the time was that, Possibly, was that right? yeah. I mean, I never really did the gear, but I did get a, a blue. Oh, Hoist had given me a blue belt. Yeah, yeah, but I wouldn't really. No, but I remember, no, no yeah. offense to Hoist, but I didn't really like. I took it, but I didn't really consider. Yeah, myself but I remember. I remember you. I remember you telling me, and it was like he's a blue belt. But this was back in the days where, yeah, ago, yeah. wow, he's a blue belt, and we started talking. I think we ended up talking more about comics than martial arts. <laughs> Probably, which is yeah. Normally, the one to how it goes, but for somebody with like you know mobility issues, grappling mm. is probably the the. the absolute worst thing you could have yeah. picked up at the time, right? But it's what Jeff was into and Jeff, what Jeff guys were really good at was the grappling. So that's what, I mean, <laughs> my first experience of, of grappling was I was sitting by the edge of the mat watching Jeff's Thursday morning class and yeah. they're all knocking the shit out of each other. And Jeff comes over and goes, right, I'm gonna show you some jokes. So he sat me there on the edge of the mat and he dug in and he's digging oh, in these jokes. And then yeah, and afterwards yeah. it was so bad my neck was swollen up and I couldn't swallow properly. Like my throat was, really? and, um, and I, I kind of, like I was quite fragile and a little bit nervous and I kind of called him over and I said, oh, like I can't swallow yeah. my throat. And he goes, oh, yeah. and Jeff's like, oh yeah, it's funny, someone else has said that to me the other day as well. I just walked <laughs> off. <laughs> um, but that's, that's kind of how I got into grappling was just watching him teach and him coming over and showing me a few moves. And um, the first time I ever actually had a little grapple it was with Jeff and I ended up down the hospital. So uh, really? yeah, it was, um, I was quite fragile and he just grabbed me and went like that and he just popped my thumb and. Um, yeah, but the, 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 back in those days, there, there was no finesse. There was, we, it was balls to the wall and smash. Yeah, but they were doing the stuff way that everyone's doing, you know, was doing years and years later. They, yeah, they yeah, were yeah way, ahead, way ahead of their time. Yeah, very, Jeff's very. awesome, you know. I told you before, the only reason I'm doing martial arts is I saw him kick the shit out of three guys outside the <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what that is, but yeah. teach me it. And yeah, it sent me down a great path, you know? I, I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for Jeff. I don't think I'd even be alive if it wasn't for Jeff. Really? Um, he, yeah, I was, I had no direction. I, I used to do really well in school. Um, you know, all my teachers were like, oh, you should be a politician, or you should be a teacher. I was doing, I was a pretty smart guy. And then, 
because of, I was at my mobility issues and the schools weren't very good at saying, oh, we'll send you work to do at home and things like yeah. that. Um, I started dropping behind and pretty much dropping out. Really? Um, so it was Jeff saying, here's this other stuff. And then also, again, timing with the internet coming along. I mean, I started selling you know, stuff online, like videos and different yeah. things. And yeah, you could make, yeah, there were ways to make money um, through the internet and then also getting contact and information from different places. And then Jeff being like, I mean, just I remember Jeff saying to me like, basically, the doctor said to me, "Oh, don't do this, don't do that, don't you won't do martial arts again." And yeah. Jeff was basically, "Fuck those guys." He was like, "No." I mean, I remember Jeff saying, "Oh, what do they know?" No, I mean, Jeff saying, um, "I remember Jeff saying, oh, I'm Jeff." Jeff went, "I'm basically disabled in this hand. I've broken yeah, it so yeah, many he's times." Got, yeah, he's, he's, got he's like, he's, he's like, "Oh, I can hardly hold a pen, but I'm a writer." So yeah, yeah and I was like, "You know what?" And yeah, uh, his, yeah, his, okay. his his attitude was just like, "Yeah, just start walking to the end of the road." Just so, so where, where did you start? What would you say you've where you started learning how to grapple? It was watching Jeff, uh, watching Jeff, learning bits from him, and then I actually had, from when I did karate as a kid, I had a, an old canvas punch bag, right. and I used to put that on the living room floor, and basically at my parents' house, and he'd just lay on it, and kind of try some of the moves, and I put a gi jacket on it, yeah. and I started trying to do some moves, and then just, I had a kind of a bit of an eye for it. Some guys happened to be setting up a little bit of a training session in Leicester, who'd done traditional jiu-jitsu, and I went along, and from Jeff, and from kind of having a bit of an eye for it, I could immediately see what they were doing and go, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And within a very short amount of time, they said, can you just teach? And, <laughs> and I was teaching, and they were competing and training when I wasn't actually able to train. Um, right. It was funny, because when I actually competed, I actually, I, there was a time when I could actually roll a bit more and I competed. The, one, the, the first time I decided to compete, I stepped into this competition, and um, I submitted the first two guys, got to the first two rounds pretty easy. And then one of my students beat all the guys on his side of the division yeah. and then facing one of my guys in the final and he beat me, submitted me. Wow, well, yeah, that, that, <laughs> so, that, that's, your, that's the epitome of being a good teacher. Well, it was funny because we got to the, we, when we got to the, uh, the semi-final round, um, they said, okay, well, you two are from the same gym and you two are from the same gym. And they wanted me to fight um, a guy that I'd already fought. And uh, I thought, oh, I don't know. And they were like, oh, your guy's definitely going to lose to this coach from another gym. Yeah. I'm like, I smashed him. And then we faced, then we faced oh, each other, wow. uh, Paul Barton, and yeah, and he submitted me with a triangle in the, in the final. But that's the thing, I was training these guys and they were getting good, but yeah. I wasn't really training myself. Um, yeah. And that's what actually led to people being attracted to where I was and people coming down and eventually led to me having the team of fighters that were known as like Team Roughhouse. And, yeah. Because I had Dan and I had Andre Winner and Jimmy Wardhead. And, you, you see, this is it, you know, like there was a who's who. Of who went over to the UFC? It was, yeah, I mean, we, I remember uh, one time there was three guys in the UFC um, and we'd had a bunch of guys on the Ultimate Fighter and, yeah, and we were still, it's funny we were still training out of, you know, spare spaces at people's gyms and we didn't have a place or, uh, but again, it was just because I had that eye for it and I could do the tactics and I could put things together and I had no, I'd never done a boxing class, never done a kickboxing class, never done a jiu-jitsu class, never done a wrestling class. I'd basically taught myself well, I was, was going to say, just as you were saying it, it's like the East Midlands version of Helio Gracie. Because that's yeah, the well, same, that's the same he trained. He, he trained. I think I didn't really get to train. But yeah, I got he to, didn't really get to train either no. for years, did he? He but, just sat there because of... Yeah. And then because... You say Helio Gracie, I say, you know, Splinter. Um, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> but, it, but it was the idea of, of watching it and kind of figuring it out and trying it on a dummy and, you know... Um, people the friends I'd occasionally I'd grab them and try it out yeah. on them and figure it out and I just just seemed to have the mind for it and it was also a lot of its time and it was the early days uh, it's very different someone stepping in to try and do that now when the sports were developed yeah. but the way it was developing then I was seeing it I remember watching me and my dad rented out the first UFC when it came out on, yeah. on VHS and then I used to get bootlegs of one and you couldn't get it anymore. Yeah. So I, I saw it right from the start and my timing was then. So it was, it was, it was yeah, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it was that difficult to catch up. Yeah, but the thing, yeah, but the thing is, Nathan, it, 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 I know you're saying that and that's taking a little bit away from yourself, but the thing is, if you're a pioneer, is, you know, what's the difference between a pioneer and a tourist? Only time. Yes. That's, that's yes. the only difference, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Well, you read the Malcolm Gladwell stuff and you look at um, like Outliers and he's talking about like, um, millionaires or like say tech millionaires and they're all born obviously in the same country in the same period of time yeah. where when they hit a certain age where they've maybe got a bit more free time but haven't actually got a full job yet yeah they have access to the early earliest computers 
Yes. And, and that means that they got to where they were, but you know, you see, you look at the ages of people like you know Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and these different guys. If they were a few years either way, or they were born on a different coast, or they were born in a different socioeconomic bracket where they weren't at a school that got the first computer or something like, they wouldn't have got where they were. Yeah. And a lot of it was I was in the Midlands, so I had access to Jeff, and yeah. I was at the time of the internet and the time of early MMA. I mean, in the time that I've been into martial arts, the changes is unreal with BJJ and who said the other day. The big ones for me have been mixed martial arts, yeah. uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and the reality-based self-defense. Yeah. Those three, which are probably all completely inaccurate names for what they are, really, yeah. um, they're the three that have changed, changed martial arts. Completely. Uh, it's from what I remember it being as a kid in the 80s to now, it's totally unidentifiable, it's totally different. You, I remember I remember back in the day where it's like, he's a black belt in karate, he has to warn you before he fights. And you're like, really? And then yeah. it's like, I saw him kick off his shoes before he had a fight and you're like, really? I, I remember people being asking, like, oh, do, you've got to register your hands as a, as a lethal weapon, don't you? And all this kind of stuff as a kid and it's like... Nonsense. Yeah, it's absolute nonsense. Well, you, you, you just hit on something there because we talked about this when we were on the phone. Um, we started off, it was a church hall. Martial yes. arts was a church hall. And now it's like you're saying, there's sleepovers, there's kids' yeah. parties, and some people will turn around and say, Matt Dojo is not a good thing. But yeah, if you're successful mm -hmm. and the people that are getting into it know what they're getting into, yeah. the, the, I can't the, see what the problem is. The diversity of martial arts has changed. I like we were saying the other day, it's, I was into it uh, in the 80s, so that end of that 70s, uh, I don't know whether it was a, the golden age there that people consider whether it was a myth or not, yeah. but I saw the end of it. I saw Terry O'Neill and some of those guys, and they were just tough guys who trained to be able to fight. Yeah. Then it moved into actual dojos. When I, when I got into it, dojos were opening up where it was, oh, it's a business a bit more now, and it's more kid-focused. I mean, the guys that, I, that were kind of the generation before me, when I spoke to them, they never trained with, in the same room as kids. They were all adult, yeah. men, all adult men training. Then it was more a business where the kids had to be in there. And I said, now it's splintered off into these places where it's all got like soft play areas. And I've been into gyms that, like, that have got a bar in the gym. <laughs> and I've, I've been into places with a, of, that these big, huge places with rings and cages and, and weights areas. And that's a huge diversity, but I said that with the Madojo thing, whether they get, they know they're getting into it and not, the problem is that they don't. Yeah. Our, our sport and our martial arts, because it's completely unregulated and you can pretty much say whatever you want, do whatever you want, yeah, make any yeah. claim you want, it obviously attracts common. Of course it does. If you, if you had a, if you had a pound for everybody who's trained you, you'd be a rich man. And there's a lot of famous oh, people who say they train oh, with Oh, yeah, I've seen CVs of people saying that they trained with me and I have no idea who they are when they would have done it or, um, or I know who they are, and I know that they definitely hadn't trained. Yeah, they, they popped it. They popped in once to see a class. You yeah. know? but it, it, we we've we've talked about this before. The you know the the cult of personality in martial arts, and not only like the I don't want to use the term sinister, but I have to because it's the only adjective <laughs> I can use, right? Uh, where it's almost self-serving, and these people mm. come in and they're broken and they're fractured, mm. and then the first thing they do is they meet some fucking egomaniac. Yeah. Some of these guys that I see in martial arts who I, I don't think are uh, honest about you know, what they can do and who they are and are like so sinister in many ways. I don't think many of them started out like that. They started out loving martial arts, thinking they wanted to share it and then realizing actually I've got all this control, I've got all this power over the people and I think that can affect some people differently and yeah. some for the worst. What, what was that, what's that line that Harvey Dent comes out with in the Batman movie? If you hang around long enough, you get to become the villain? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, I think, that's, I think that's, a, that's a pretty true statement, especially if you're surrounded by people that actually buy into this shit. Yeah. You know, you, you, I, you know it's one thing I've said before, I mentioned it earlier about my wife. The one great thing about my wife is she just does not buy any of it. <laughs> uh, literally, she's like the first person to turn around and tell me that I'm full of shit. Mm. And uh, you know, as much as that annoys me sometimes, it's good. It's good to have at least one person in the world. So I don't. Yep. I don't pay attention to anyone else. I don't even pay attention to the police. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? My wife's the only <laughs> person I actually listen to. That's the truth. If police, are you listening? Well, Sting maybe. I don't know. What's the other guy's name? No, sorry. <laughs> no. So when when you you started teaching, right? 
So how did it all explode then? Because it, um, it couldn't just, or could it just be a group of like pretty game lads? Yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of timing, and some guys. It was also obviously with that period. People come into it now with no background. People came into it then with a background. So Andre Winner turned up. Uh, one of my friends, John Deacon, said, "Oh, I know this young kid. He's really athletic. He's done a bit of karate. I'll bring him down. I'll teach him a self defense session." He brought him down. Um, Jimmy Warled was knocking around the area. He'd done judo. Came yeah. in. He was like 19 years old. I remember him wandering in, and they're all kind of looking for something, and obviously they've seen this thing that's no hard bar, this Valley to do that was coming yeah. up, and they all kind of wanted to get involved with it, and obviously because I had a little bit more knowledge than them, because that's the thing, only thing with this is it's just you further down the path, or you have a bit of better eyesight down the path, and you yeah. can just kind of help them along. So I was doing that, and then that started to attract people like Dan, who was already training, already fighting, um, and then you know like guys like Paul Daly would nip in a bit, and then I had other guys who I was building up as well, and it just created this group who were just really, really strong for the time. Yeah. Um, and also because I liked the grappling and in particular I liked the wrestling and the cage work and that was a big weakness. Because a lot of the MMA stuff you can find in other sports. Yeah. You know, anyone can walk in the door and be able to throw a punch because they've done boxing or something else. Someone could come in and then I throw a kick because they've done cycle. No one's going to walk in knowing how to do cage work. No. Um, cage- and, we, and we don't we don't have a wrestling background. It's no. not it's not like North America. But even then, they wouldn't know how to do it against yeah. the wall um, or, or do ground and pound. And they're the two things: the ground and pound and the cage work. That I was like, you know what? If we focus on that, especially the cage work, because that can get us down to the ground and get us back up, we can just kind of dominate with that. And for a long time, that's pretty much what we dominated with. Even my strikers, like Andre, weren't really knocking people out. They were pinning them against the wall and beating them up the whole fight. Yeah. Um, and that's that's where we dominated for so long because literally no one else was doing it, and you, they couldn't. Guys were stepping in with judo background or boxing background and dominating with that, and we knew anyone, any we could face that anywhere, yeah. And they could get experience training with guys like that, yeah. But unless they figured out the cage work themselves or someone they brought someone in to show it, they just wouldn't know any of it. They yeah. wouldn't know the head position. They wouldn't know the angles on the cage. They wouldn't know how to make people come off the cage and walk into things. And yeah. so we we focused on that and that. Took us a long way. Yeah, it's the king, um, kingdom, of, kingdom of the blind, eh? The blind yes. man is king, yeah, eh? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that because outside, when you look, when you look at the wall, it's like a who's who. And yeah, you know, you've been you're gracious enough. I was like Marcelo Garcia, and you were like the one time only. You know, so the, yeah, you the, one, the one time only was here. Yeah, I, the one I had time with the... Marcelo Garcia is enough. That's one more than me. Yeah. Well, when I trained with him, he it was it was just a seminar, and um, there actually there was a cue to roll at the end, and I was the next in in line when they stopped the rolling, so I was oh. I was wounded with that. But uh, he did come round and demo things, and I felt him, and I felt his base was like nothing I've ever felt before. Really? He literally squatted down on his heels with his knees off the ground. I tried to move. Him and I couldn't move him. I was yeah. like, "How's that even physically possible?" Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Bradley, Bradley Stephen said to me once. He goes, "He turtled up and he goes, it was like trying to push an anvil." Yeah, he was. He's, he was he's, solid. Yeah, he was solid. And um, I got to admit, I really enjoyed the seminar, but at the time, it didn't go in. But you know, sometimes you've got to see things that you don't really understand because then later it will, yeah. it will, you know, and also it will stretch you. One of my favorite things is I saw. Um, that's comic books. I saw Alan Moore talk once. Right. And someone was asking Alan Moore about what books he reads, and he went. I only read books I don't understand. Really? Wow. And I was like, oh my, and then, I, and then literally just last week I saw some, um, I can't remember, some musician and guitarist saying, yeah, I mostly try and play, play things that I can't play. Really? So why would you, why would you already do the things you can? It's not going to stretch you. Um, and I think that's, that, that tells a lot. That's, you know, putting yourself out there and things that you can't do will stretch you. Uh, it's funny you say this. I'm going to, I'm going to embarrass my son here because we've got Charlie here. Sorry. But it's, yeah, it's my show so I can do it. <laughs> Uh, one, yeah, Ch- Charlie is. I've said before. He's. I told Dan Harley. He's a very, very uh, intelligent guy. Very, very funny. But he's one of the. What, uh, it's the truth. He's, one of the he's putting people. a lot of faces at yeah, you. Yeah, right no, now. no. It's so embarrassing, horrendously. But Charlie, I've t- how many times I've told you, he's one of the only guys that really does inspire me, because when he was growing up, it was like. Unicycle, like it was like he, he turns back now and he says I'm an odd kid, but it was like he wanted to he wanted to unicycle, so he went on YouTube, and then bought a unicycle. Yeah. Wanted to juggle, did the same. Wanted to play guitar, did the same. And it's like he is one of those characters. It's like he's very very similar. That's why I wanted you to come down. Yeah. I know it's my show and I don't care. <laughs> so there you are, Charlie. Now you got it. But it was like the same, very same, like yeah, the the thought process behind it and the embracing of the grind, not physically. Mm. 
But so, you know, mentally well, just, and psychologically. Just, just hearing that, that was inspiring me because I'm quite. An, I have loads of anxiety issues and things. I don't like putting myself out yeah, there yeah. that much. It's kind of why I like people say, "Oh, you stand in front of a room." But so, yeah, because I get to tell everyone what to do. That's like, <laughs> that's like that's a, for anyone with anxiety issues, teaching is brilliant because everyone, oh. everyone has to do exactly what you say. Yeah. Obviously, you come off, and then they speak to you, and you can go and hide in the office. But <laughs> it's like, but but hearing that because. Yeah, most people won't do that. I remember someone saying once, um, people learn to be boring because they, as a kid, you you will you go, oh, I want to learn to ride that or play that. You would just do it. Yeah. And then somebody once makes you feel bad about doing it and you feel, oh, I shouldn't do that. And people learn to be boring because everyone, you know, you see a kid and they'll, you know. Yeah, it's a path, people, of, it's yeah. A path of least resistance. Yeah, people will say, everyone will stand back and watch a kid because they're fearless because they'll, they'll jump off this and play with this and it's like, it's entertaining. Yeah. And it's mainly because you will feel that you should be like that too. Yeah, yeah. Um, But you don't, you learn to be boring. And but, people who, who fight against that, they're the ones who inspire. Yeah, so I, I put this on uh, Facebook and I know Facebook's really cheesy. Most people have put their, you know, they, either, they do their dirty laundry on air uh, <laughs> or they put pictures of their dinner. But every now and again, there'll be a meme there. And I put this up a couple of days ago, which is no man is born a warrior, just like no man is born an average man. Yeah. You make the choice. And, you know, I, I'm evangelical about martial arts because I've seen it change people's lives. I've seen yeah. a few people where it, they've gone to that extreme where they should have been drawn back a little bit and say, listen, yeah. the amount you're doing is just bad. Mm-hmm. You can't get enough of a good thing and you know i could come up with a really really sick joke but i'm not going to uh, that'll be off air we'll do that one but uh no it's like too much oxygen is bad for you too much water is bad for you too much yeah. food is bad for you anything and it, yeah and it's 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 going to lead me on to something that you know today you did something that just clicked and then it was really cool because you obviously it was just a conversation with dan and then next thing dan caught got you out to explain the point oh uh, dan's cool like that a couple of times he acknowledged me by the side or at the start it's about frames and he did that and yeah. um that's just dan being nice no 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 it wasn't it was uh, yeah because i've often thought about it it was the whole kicking and punching thing mm. and basically where it's like the hands dropping and it's not being lazy it's it's naturally counterbalancing the counterbalancing definitely i mean yeah it's, it obviously came about because dan slipped and dropped his hand and everyone asked why are you kind of doing that and yeah Part of it is the twitch, like when you throw a kick, you want to twitch your hips, you drop your hands. Yes. And there's a bit of that. But the main thing is that is what we were discussing, which is the counterbalance. If I move both my hands and my head to one side, that's a lot of weight. If I drop that hand down a bit, it's just counterbalancing, just a little bit. Enough. Even yeah. if it's just take, if it, I mean, it's taking away a bit of weight from here and putting a bit of weight over there. So it's not a lot, but it's enough that I can come back quicker. Um, and yeah, we were discussing that you see like, People do do a lot of kicks, often having the hands out, and then in you know Savat having both hands out behind to throw exactly. your foot really far. Yeah. Because it, yeah, your hands moving around do balance both your leg going up, but also your head as well. So you see, hands, guys who drop their hands a lot do tend to do a lot of leaning and rolling around because if they were hands were there, they would fall over. Yeah, you said, no, it's it's funny because you mentioned it as well when we were talking about Conor McGregor, and it was I. The minute you said it, I just had this flashback because in, in, his, in his last fight, everyone was going, man, it was just boom, you know, it was so quick. Yeah, how did he do it? And you're like, well, there's a couple of like, factors. Yeah. Like, the biggest factor, I think, was as you, you know, the whole way through, he just did the alley thing and he just basically got into his head. Oh, destroyed know? him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he wasn't ready for it, right? Aldo steps in. I mean, I, I wasn't, I didn't want to, it's a shame. Aldo, when you're champion, you take a break you only get to step back in at the highest level, whereas yeah. what you need is a tune-up fight. Yeah. You do, if you're out for over a year and you come back in, you need a tune-up fight if you're fighting, because the number one contender is on a momentum. Uh-huh. And your momentum is completely stopped. No. You, you cannot step back in at that level most of the time. It just doesn't happen. So for him, A, to have to do that, and then B, to get mentally broken as well, yeah. it, I felt sorry for him. But you see, this is the thing, it was like when, I'd spoken to a few people and they said, yeah, but you know, Conor McGregor, he comes from a bad background too. And I was like, he's never been Jose Aldo poor. Yeah. You know, there's poor and then there's Jose Aldo poor. But it was like all the way through the build up, even, you know, all of this karate stuff he was doing. Yeah. Uh, literally, when two guys go like this, you know it's going to be a war. Yeah. yeah. And even with the warm up, as he was, you know, as he was waiting and it almost looked like he was doing capoeira. Yeah. And then when you said about the counterbalancing, I immediately thought, yeah, this guy's just gonna. It's gonna be awesome. And then what? What did he do? He went in, did just the JKD, <laughs> high, low, high, bang, hit yeah. the guy. And I was like, yeah, you know, Bruce Lee's been dead since what? 
73 and we're still using the same principles yeah. you know occupy the high line then the midline and then bang and it's just really I, the balance thing and the fact that you noticed it you know this is another one 31 years of martial arts and I now can switch kick because I've this is true <laughs> I've ne I never ever done a switch kick I've, because I've never done Thai boxing ever yeah. in a right lead and yeah. I had to work today with David yeah, Rogers I, well I got asked to do it for the first time today like about 20 seconds before I started oh kick. right because okay. the, the guy I said, I said one of the other guys Eugene was like oh how did you do the switch there because I've only ever done boxing and I'm like okay and he goes right yeah I'm left handed and I was like Oh, and then I, I, I did it, and then I came over to you. Yeah, and then we we chatted about it. Yeah, because I, I said it, I said it to Dan, I said it to Dan Hardy because we were working. Obviously, I'm working in the right lead. And he says, "Oh, you're moving really well." And I said, "Have you ever seen Princess Bride?" <laughs> yeah, I like, oh, I did it. <laughs> I'm not left-handed either. Yeah, and he was like, "Oh man, that's cool." But uh, the eye to de eye for detail is that something that you think you've learned, or is it the, is it the fact that you know? We're, we're both self-confessed geeks. It's partly the geek thing. Um, it's partly because, again, because I wasn't physically doing it a lot of the time, it wasn't that I could remember it by doing it when I was coming up in this. I had to watch it, figure it out, and then explain it to somebody else. Because I, so, I mean, I, I had people often, I would get them doing something, and then I'd not actually done it myself that much because physically I found it maybe too difficult to do yeah. it. Or if I did try it, I wouldn't be able to teach the next class or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, it's like with the guys. I mean, I, I remember, you know, doing game plans for fighters, going to the UFC, get them fighting, and I'd never spot MMA, because physically it would have been too much to do all those you know, level changing and shooting and stuff, but I trained them to do it. Yeah. So a lot of it was just, I had to have the eye for the detail because it was, I had to figure it out, understand how it worked, and then explain it to somebody else. Yeah, but that was it, you know, Jose Mourinho, Jose Mourinho, when he first, first got involved in football, he was a translator for Bobby Robson. And, that, 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 and that's why he was so successful because he never looked at football yeah. like a footballer. That's why yeah. you know, athletes don't make necessarily good coaches. I mean, the thing with me trying to learn it, I wasn't learning it by having someone teach me. I was learning it by watching other instructors on videos or in books. So I was trying to learn the way other instructors thought about it. Which yeah. just gave me a different viewpoint from someone who could, it's just training, could just do it. Yeah. It was actually just trying to learn from the best thinkers about it. So guys like Dan Danaher's book uh, that he did with Henzo Gracie, Master in Jiu-Jitsu, was one of my favourite books. It was amazing. Love it. Yeah, it Still was, love it. Yeah, because yeah. uh, when I read that, it was like, oh, that's exactly the way I feel about it. Yeah. And that's exactly the way I look, I look at it. And to see someone of his level so far above where I'm at and go, oh, it's actually on the same kind of line, it's way, way further down the road, but the same kind of line. It's like, you know, I'm not reading it going, I have no idea what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, I kind of knew I was on the right track. I, I, like, I liked uh, one of Dana's uh, quotes where somebody was saying about, it, it wasn't the mystical properties of martial arts, but yeah. it was sort of like going down that esoteric route. Yeah. And uh, he said, it is just an exercise in body mechanics, will. That's yeah. it. Body <laughs> mechanics and will are the two things you need to understand. Yeah. He said everything after that, you know. But he was like, he's he's a big fan of uh, you know compliance, working together, this mm. uh, collaborative, you know, exercise, and then you know, collaborate first and then break away. Which we don't do in martial arts. No, we go adversarial straight away. Yeah. and then work out why one guy's crying. The the best things most guys could do is just slow the fuck down a bit. Like that's it. I mean, often I send people out and go, right, we'll do it slow, and then I stop them just before they're about to start and go, however fast you're about to do it, let's halve that. Yeah. Because I know their initial way of wanting to do it is probably gonna be way, way, way too fast. If they just slowed it down that bit, they would have time to think and feel and be more mindful about what's going on, and then they'd remember it more. It's the old Brazilian thing, isn't it? Is it two percent, my friend? And then the next thing they do, they stack past you, and you feel like this is a reeve. You know what I mean? It's like, God, why did you just break my neck? Is that two percent? And uh, yeah, I think that's more. That's more machismo than anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nobody yeah. has another ninety-eight percent of that waiting for no, me. No. Yeah, not well, I don't know. Unless you're in the new Batman movie, that that would be it. Right, so. As I was saying, outside it's like a who's who, you know, and I know some of those pictures you've trained extensively with some of these guys. Some mm -hmm. of them are buddy pictures, which we all have, yeah, yeah, yeah. but who's been like the biggest inspiration on you? Oh, um, 
I mean, there's people that I've not trained with who have been inspirations, but I think it's, I've got to go back to Jeff because I, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for yeah. Jeff. And the, a martial artist of his caliber and a fighter of his caliber always, always, always pushed himself to try new things. Yeah, Whether yeah, it was yeah. taking up wrestling or taking up judo. And if he did it, he went to the best people. Um, I mean, I've been lucky enough the last couple of years, um, uh, Matt Chapman, uh, and he's yeah. down south. I, yeah, I got, yeah. became friends with Matt. I did, a, guy. I did a couple of seminars at his place and he's kind of invited me into a little group. And I've yeah. kind of through them, I've met um, you know, Tony Davis and Bob Breen awesome and different guys, guys. Yeah. Um, Tom Callis, met all kinds of different guys. Tom, Tom Callis is awesome. I spent a weekend just sitting there chatting with him like this. Really? And it just blew my mind. No, I've never, it, never heard anything like it. The way he views martial arts and teaching and the role of an instructor and what they are capable of. I mean, the stories he told me about what a martial artist could do for his community and what yeah. he, him and his, you know, the 100 do. The 100, like, yeah. um, unreal. Well, he, he still does, Tom does this thing, Tom, Tom Callis is actually one of the guys I want to see uh, over in the States because he still does that charity house build every year. Yeah, well, this thing, I, I saw all the community things and how he is with kids and, um, He's, he's also is like a, he was saying one he messaged all these guys and said right our, our job this year is we're just going to save a kid's life so let's just figure that out so one of the things he does he looks through news stories and he looks through news stories and he found a kid had died in a house fire yeah so he said right let's figure it out what we're going to do and they made up a bunch of like red dots gave them to parents and then in the school the, the, uh, the classes they made like assault courses with these red dots and made kids follow them and then told the parents take them home find a way out the house and make a game of it. Time yeah. your kid doing it, time yourself doing it, make it a game. And like, we'll do it in the, in the gym so they get the idea and then you go and do that at home. A little while later, one of the instructors phones up, Tom says, oh yeah, one of those parents had just called back, there was a fire, it saved their kid's life. And you just go, awesome. that's the, the thing is with Tom though, I heard all these kind of stories and he was telling them and it was just blowing my mind. And then I thought, yeah, I mean, I know he's legit, but yeah. how legit is he? So I was like bringing up videos of him doing stuff and I'm yeah. like, Oh no, actually, he's pretty fucking good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, so like I was watching his pad work stuff, and I was like, yeah. "Oh, actually." Because he's famous. He's famous. Famously, the stepfather of who? Keenan Cornelius. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, one of the best jiu-jitsu guys in the world. And uh, there's two things why I really like Tom Callis. Uh, first of all, it was not so much it, the way. He, well, the way the Lloyd Irvin thing, because at the time Keenan was training with Lloyd yeah. Irvin, and he was being super successful. Yeah. You know, and it was it was. It taken him from one level to another, and I know it was a combination of Tom, but more Keenan because he's his own man. Mm. But they made the decision, and it was a, like this, it, you know, it was it was the ethically the yeah. best decision because it was like no matter how good you are, I can't be here because yeah. he was living in the house. Well, Lloyd, I mean, Lloyd was becoming one of the most successful instructors in the world. I mean, his teams were his team was ranking in the top three in certain tournaments and in big tournaments. And he was getting a, a room full of killers, and also he was really promoting his guys. And um, yeah, so when Tom found out about it, I saw him be really outspoken straight away. Well, he did. Up. And a lot of other guys weren't. A lot no, of no, guys he weren't. no. It, this is the thing. The one thing that really got me was, um, you know, once the story started coming out, I have to admit, I'd love to interview Lloyd Irvin. Yeah. I think it'd be the shortest interview ever because. You know, yeah. the, the elephant in the room would have to be addressed. But there was but a lot of guys hang, still still hanging on. Hanging on. Because of the money. Going. There was yeah. a lot of money around. There was a lot of though. And the other one as well was, it was like, when you when you heard about the stories, it was like Lord of the Flies. Yeah. You got in there and you, you slept in the basement. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, obviously, I don't know him personally. I don't know how much of it is. Because, I mean, you know, there are there will be people hating on him. Yeah. It's the internet. But the hot, but yeah, but the but, hot house, the hot but, house in... But from what I, the, I did hear... It, I was disgusted. Yeah, by it. if 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 ten percent of what I heard was true, yeah, exactly. that, that was enough for me. Yeah. So they did that, and then there was the uh, the other one with Tom was the uh, Steve Lavalley. I don't. I didn't Steve Lavalley was the guy. I didn't see that. He was the first ever. He was the first ever martial arts billionaire. Right. And uh, John Will was telling me about him, uh, and this was a guy who basically he franchised it that good that basically when you picked up the book, the first thing would be all the light switches were in the same place. So it was like, it was, he McDonald's the yeah. all. So he was the first guy to make a billion dollars out of martial arts. And then what happened was he hung himself and he was a like friend of Tom Callis's. Mm. Uh, so straight away, Tom puts this thing out. And then the next thing you know, find out that he was actually, he was, he was 
he was going to be arrested that day mm -hmm. and that's why he did it right. and yeah there was accusations but that yeah there was there was a lot of them mm -hmm. and straight away boom tom Callis was on it immediately again and he mm -hmm. was like that I, I have to withdraw like yeah there was still support for the family and everything yeah, yeah. but he just turned around and goes if that's the case uh, I'm I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in myself that I could be friends with somebody like that. Mm -hmm. And immediately, you're like, n n for me personally, I, yeah, I've seen him on the pads. Awesome. Seen yeah. his jujitsu. Awesome. You know, the guy yeah. just broke his leg. Yeah. Did you see that break? I saw, saw the photo. Oh, saw the X-ray. Yeah. Oh, it was horrendous. He's like, what is he like? 58, 60. At least, yeah, yeah. Jesus. But he's one of those guys like you. You hear him talk and it, like how he ran um, like several gyms and he's had all these huge numbers of students and that he does it. And you think, oh, he's kind of like maybe in that dojo mold. Yeah. But then actually he's got a lot of integrity. Super and, ethical. And yeah. how good he is as well. Um, yeah, he's one of those guys that I've met in the last couple of years and gone, you know what, I'm functioning on too low a level with this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like him and Bob Breen, and you mentioned John Will. John yeah. Will, I went and trained with John Will and I literally walked out and my wife messaged me and said, oh, how did it go? And I said, you know what, I shouldn't be allowed to teach martial arts. Was that, that was at Tony Davis's? I think it was one just before that. Because I, I as soon as I trained with him, I started following him around. Yeah, because um, Tony Tony had a private and I was supposed to be there. And I yes, knew I went did that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wayne Stokes, I think, yeah. might have I've done I've done three, three or four small private, like, handful of people sessions with him now and done a few seminars Yeah, with him. John's easily... The, Prem, one of the most premier educators in the world. Mm. I've booked him to come here. He's here this year. Really? Yeah. I'm there. You heard that first, <laughs> all right? Uh, so what's the future hold for you? Oh, um, I don't know. We were discussing this the other day. Yeah. Well, I want to come and train with you for a start. I want to um, come and train with him. Definitely. Um, it's, it's funny. You get a point where you go, okay, I'm doing martial arts, and then you start teaching, and then you decide to open up a school, and then you're not always a martial artist you're a business owner a lot of the time yeah so at the moment i'm finding that i'm a business owner really? and i want to get back to being a martial artist so whether that means being a better business owner and delegating having to do stuff <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. or whether that just means doing more um i, I need to find my way again and because i'm not really doing any grappling at the moment um you know rosie sexton's working with me to try and improve yeah. my mobility and strength uh, so i might get back to it a bit more but for now I'm looking to maybe explore some other areas of, of martial arts and hopefully bring that back and give it to the guys and, and, and the girls here and see if it can help them too. No, that's it, yeah. Well, you know what it is, I'm going to do martial arts, I'm going to learn and try and pass it on to other people. That's, that's it, I'm going to do yeah. it. Yeah, well, I hang out with cool people and do cool shit. That, that's, that's, all, that's the only reason I got into martial <laughs> arts. I used to say, first of all, I got into martial arts because I saw Mr. Miyagi. Mr. Miyagi got Daniel LaRusso hooked up <laughs> with Elizabeth Shue. Yeah, Elizabeth no, Shue. I, that was one of the things that made me want to do it. Was it? Yeah. Oh, hey, fist bump on that. I tell you what. And then when I saw her leaving Las Vegas, I really wanted to be with her. If you haven't seen that movie, it's a good one. It's, it's. Uh, I think it's fifteen. Uh, no, it's pretty cool. Well, Nathan, it's been awesome chatting to you. Man. Lovely Thanks to see you. Again. Now,